Okay, everybody, this is our second video on World War One. We're going to do a little bit more world history here before we dive into U.S. history. Uh, we talked about the origins last time. This time we're going to discuss a little bit more about the participants, um, namely the two camps that emerged during this war, which would be the Central Powers and the Triple Entente. We didn't get around to talking about this particular map. Um, this goes back to the question of what makes this war a world war as opposed to other wars, regional wars uh, that happened in the past? Well, this war is a world war because it is of truly global proportions. It is a war in which many, many fronts exist, fronts that span the globe. And why is that? What makes that possible? The very makeup of the geopolitical order a hundred years ago. The very makeup of the geopolitical order a hundred years ago, in which you had a dozen or so uh, major nations, industrialized nations, European nations, themselves having staked out what they called spheres of influence throughout the world, collections of colonies for various purposes. Um, it is only in that context when you have a dozen or so major powers scattered throughout the world, each one claiming a sphere of influence, and then you introduce conflict among these rival powers. When that conflict emerges, that conflict will also be of a global character, precisely because the belligerents in this war are frankly positioned all over the world. We tend to focus on the mother country but wherever there was a colony, okay, wherever there was a colony, and that colony was across the border from a rival nation's, an enemy nation's colony, there would be war, there would be a front. So what we're looking at here, the Western Front, the Western Front is the, is the front that develops in northern France once the Germans march through Belgium, and that is the front that, for the most part, we are going to pay almost exclusive attention to when we talk about the American experience in World War One, because that is the front that the Americans fight in. You have the Eastern Front, okay, that is the front between the Germans and the Austrians versus the Russian Empire. And as you can see on that map, the Russians do really badly. They are pushed eastward significantly, um, almost to Moscow. As you can see, Moscow right there. Keep in mind, the Russian capital at the time was St. Petersburg. Um, not Moscow. Um, the British take advantage um, of the Turks perhaps being uh, the weakest power of the central powers. Uh, everything you see there in green, these are the central powers because they span all of Central Europe and into the Middle East. Um, what you see there in yellow, particularly in the European continent, I think that's yellow, that would be the Triple Entente, France, Great Britain, and Russia. Um, the British being positioned in Egypt, Egypt being a British colony, um, being positioned in the British Raj, which we know of as India, uh, will take advantage and open up fronts against, you know, southern, southern fronts against the Turks as well. Um, in Egypt, the British are going to send a very famous British officer by the name of T.E. Lawrence. If you ever get a chance to see the movie Lawrence of Arabia, you should. T.E. Lawrence successfully enlists the various um, Arab tribes of the Levant, people that today we would call Palestinians, uh, Syrians, Jordanians, um, promises of independence if they would win in order to organize a insurgent, an insurgency, a guerrilla war against the Turks, keep them busy there. The, the, the British plan was to pull the Ottomans apart, have them fight on so many different fronts that they would be overwhelmed and eventually collapse. If the Turks collapse, there goes the German um, overland supply routes um, that reach out to the rest of the world since the British blockade in place is doing a great job in keeping the Germans um, from using that, from using the ocean as as um, 
in order to supply their needs. Um, there's going to be food shortages throughout <clears throat> the war, by the way. <clears throat> they opened up, the British opened up a southeastern front by marching colonial Indian troops, uh, troop, uh, Indian, Indian troops from colonial Britain, I mean from colonial India, um, across per Persia. To, so, you know, you have Indians fighting this war on behalf of the British Empire. You have Arabs fighting this war on behalf of the British Empire. The French were no different. The French had Algerians. The French had Moroccans. They had people, colonial subjects from their various colonies around the world, along also in the trenches, shoulder to shoulder with Frenchmen. Um, then, of course, across the Caucasus, the Russians open up a northeastern front against the Turks. This is this is an important um, because the people that are going to get caught in the crossfire are going to be the Armenians. And the Turks are going to take reprisals on the Armenian population. The Armenian population lived um, right there in the border between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And the Turks believing that the Armenians had allied themselves with the Russians. Well, that's where you're going to get the Armenian Genocide, uh, an event that the Turks even deny till to this day. And the British are also going to send, uh, because if you're part of the British Commonwealth, you're going in as well, New Zealand, Australian uh, troops to try to break through the Straits of Istanbul at the Battle of Gallipoli. So that's the British plan to like just, just drive the Turks crazy with a gazillion fronts. Um, and then the one front I forgot to mention, you see right there in the northern border of what was then Italy and Austria, the Italians used to be part of the Central Powers, and they, well, that, they had an agreement with the Austrians. Very, Italy was very close to the Austrians. Remember, Italy and Germany were very new nations at this time. Um, but they decided they stood more to gain by joining the French. And the French convinced the Italians, open up a southwestern front, the southwestern flank, they called it, against the Austrians. Keep them busy there so they don't reinforce the German lines in northern France. And you just may get a piece of land out of this. And, and, the, and the Italians were interested in this piece of land called the Tyrol. Right, a very small piece of land there. They, at the time was in Austria, but most of the people living there were considered themselves ethnic Italians. So that was, you know, again, a number of fronts. And this is just, these are just the fronts that we see, you know, pretty much in the European theater. That's not where the, the, the war was in no way contained to the European theater. For example, if we look at a map of Northern Africa and, and, and the Middle East, you know, there's not going to be any fighting between the Algerians and the Libyans and the Egyptians because, uh, well, that's a French colony, an Italian colony, and a British colony. They're all on the same side. Um, but right there where you see a front between... Uh, British controlled Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, that's that there's going to be a front right there. And um, they're also going to use the other side of the Arabian Peninsula to open up another front against the Turks. And if we really zoom out, you know, then you really then you get a better idea of how the you know, the global scope of this war, everything in orange was essentially the the, the central powers. Okay, the Central Powers and their extended colonies. Yes, the Austrians didn't have colonies um, anywhere else. They were, they were pretty much occupied with uh, competing with the Turks for... Um, what's the right word we're, we're looking for? Um, influence in the Balkans. The Turks had um, the Levant and a good chunk of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but the Germans had colonies in, in Africa. And, and they would be smaller in scope. There would be conflict there as well, um, particularly in, in German uh, Southwest Africa, which one day we would call Namibia. That's what it's called today. And also in German-controlled Indonesia, the Japanese are going to side with the Triple Entente and hit German targets in Asia, hoping to get something out of it from the West. And, you know, there's consequences to this later on. So... Let's, let's look at the players in this game. Let's first look at the Central Powers. Um, very easy, I'll help you. Okay, the Central Powers. So th this is um, Bulgaria, Turkey, Germany, and Austria-Hungary. 
the biggest, most powerful of them all, okay, is going to be the German Empire. Remember, Germany is a relatively new country. It was only born in 1870, I believe. There's already like their third monarch, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Um, he is from the Hohenz Hohenzollern House, the House of Hohenzollern, uh, a noble house in Germany. He was 55 at the time the war broke out. Um, they had already been on a path of of embracing a more aggressive foreign policy ever since uh, the Kaiser uh, sacked Otto von Bismarck, the longtime chancellor of not just Prussia, but later on the German Empire. He got rid of him because he wanted to pursue a more aggressive foreign policy, one namely challenging the British for dominion over the seas. They had actually put together a plan to eventually meet and surpass the size of the British Navy. Um, remember, you know, this is this is the late 19th century and great powers need great navies. This is what Alfred Mahan said, the biggest navy in the world at the time with the British and the Germans um, under Kaiser Wilhelm wanted to challenge the British for dominion over the seas. Um, Wilhelm basically, after he sacked Bismarck, exercised near dictatorial power over Germany's military and this new aggressive foreign policy. Um, he's going to survive the war and, the, you know, spoiler alert, he survives the world war, abdicates the throne and goes and lives the rest of his life in exile in the Netherlands. Another 23 years. His ally, the, the folks that, I mean, nobody even talks about them starting the war, but and the Austrians or the Austro-Hungarians, that means, that was the flag of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That means the Emperor Franz Joseph had legitimate claim to both the throne of Austria and the throne of Hungary. And he comes from the famous House of Habsburg, one of the oldest um, noble houses in you know, the history of European nobility, going all the way back to Carlos I. Um, not that he was the first, you know, Habsburg, but one of the greatest Habsburg kings of Europe. Um, he was already, he was the oldest of the monarchs in Europe at the time. He's already 84 years old. His nephew that he had planned to ascend to the throne one day was killed in Sarajevo. Um, he would not survive this war. And remember, these are very conservative regimes. Wilhelm uh, and Franz Joseph, these are the last of the remaining very conservative, very much still believing in traditional monarchy and divine right to some extent. This is old Europe, old uh, monarch Europe that is still trying to cling on to the way things have been for centuries into the 20th century. Um, he won't survive this war and he will be uh, replaced by um, a remaining nephew, Archduke Karl. And here's some Austrian troops. The, their uniform was blue for some reason. Um, not necessarily in that picture, but somewhere in the ranks of the Austrians, there's um, an aspiring art student who is going to be forever transformed by this experience. Um, here's, here's a picture showing you just, unlike the other countries that were pretty homogeneous. Um... Austria-Hungary was the challenge to hold together because the Austrians and the Hung Hungarians might have been the largest, most dominant ethnic group. But there was a number of them, and a number of them had nationalist aspirations for them of themselves, whether it's Poles in the north, or or or, or, or Yugoslav people in, in right there in Bosnia that only had recently been annexed by the by the Austrians, and you have Romanians. Um, so just holding holding together this very, on top of the fact that it was perhaps even though he was the la, he was one of those last very conservative old European rulers, um, Austria-Hungary was very liberal uh, in its, uh, its society, if you will. Its society was very liberal, uh, much more open than a lot of parts of Europe. Um, much friendlier to Jews, a lot less anti-Semitism in, in the Austro-Hungary of this period than we would see in other parts of Europe or later. 
I mean, it's a fun fact. At around this time, in the city of Vienna, which was the capital, um, three interesting people lived in that city at the same time. Um, Sigmund Freud, Adolf Hitler, and Joseph Stalin. For some strange twist of history, all lived in Vienna at the same period of time, shortly before this war. And the last of the central powers, kind of, it was it was actually the oldest of the empires in Europe at the time. Um, oldest, going already several centuries old by this time. Um, these are the same Turks that, that brought down the Byzantine Empire and took Constantinople and renamed it Istanbul. Um, you know, for years tried to push further and further. In, into Central Europe. The reason why there's so many Muslims in the Balkans has a lot to do with, you know, a, throughout the centuries, series of, of pushes by the Turks further and further into Central Europe. They almost reached Vienna at one point. And so, you know, the Ottoman Empire uh, had one foot in Europe and one foot in, in the Middle East, a Muslim country, but uh, with deep roots in European history as well, a history of rivalry with the Russians, okay, a uh, history of rivalry with the Austrians for influence in the Balkans. Um, so who's running the Ottoman Empire at the time? And, and nobody really ever blames him. He seems to have been, uh, you know, uh, a, a typical ruler born into it, but not really on the driver's seat. Mehmed V was 70 years old, 70 years old. I mean, he had barely been on in, in, in power by the time the war started. The one that really directed things was his military advisor, Enver Pasha. He's the one that secretly negotiated with the Germans to launch a surprise attack against the Russians, um, which would they have fought before in the Crimean War in the 1850s. Um, so there was bad blood there, just like there was bad blood between the Germans and the French. Um, and this sneak attack um, on the Russians um, is what launches the Ottoman Turks into this war on the side of the Central Powers. And, 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 and Turkey is extremely important to Germany. With Turkey's coast frozen in the winter and a British blockade, uh, making sure that most things don't get past that blockade, um, it, it's pretty much you know up to Turkey to keep those supply lines open. Now, on the other side, the Triple Entente. Now, important. You need to remember, only three countries technically were officially members of the Triple Entente. That would be the French Republic, Great Britain, and the Russian Empire. What about those other flags, Mr. Hernandez? The United States and Italy come in later. The Italians come in a year later, the Kingdom of Italy at the time, because it did have a king. But Italy is considered an associate power. It's not, on, it's not here on the slide, but even Japan comes in as an associate power. And of course, the United States eventually joins the war in um, 1917 um, as an associate power. And by, that, by the end of that war, I mean, the, these are the leaders that we're looking at. Uh, Prime Minister um, Orlando. He, Italy has a king at this time, so, you know, it's a constitutional monarchy. Um, Prime Minister Lloyd George of Great Britain, again, another constitutional monarchy. Prime, um, Prime Minister Clemenceau, um, French, um, but then again, France was a republic. And then by the time the end of the war, Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States. And there's one missing player we have here. Let's see if, if you guys know who that is. Well, we'll get to him later. Um, so here's pictures of French troops. Um, when this war started, everybody pretty much suffered the same mistake. They were fighting the last war. And the last war was a long time ago, um, back in the 1870s, um, with the exception of you know the, the colonial, the wars of colony throughout the world, and um, they had learned that the nature of warfare had changed very quickly. For example, camouflage, not taken seriously. Okay, in the beginning of this war, 
you know, you still had French uh, Zwavi troops showing up with red baggy pants and red kepi hats and getting killed. It's World War One that forces the, the, the armies of Europe to start taking camouflage ser- seriously and abandoning uh, regimental colors, uh, you know, distinctly colored uniforms. That's, that's not going to work anymore. And um, the French are going to fight, for the most part, on the Western Front in the trenches. And it's not just going to be Frenchmen, it's going to be men from the French colonies as well. Great Britain, in the defense of Belgium, is also going to pour millions of men into Europe and lose millions as well. Um, I told you that Britain was a constitutional monarchy. King George V um, was the ruling monarch of... um, Great Britain. That is the grandfather of the current Queen Elizabeth II, by the way. Um, uh, if you if you know if you've watched the Crown, Queen Elizabeth II, as, as well as her son Prince Charles and her grandchildren uh, Harry and William, they all belong to the House of Windsor. But interestingly enough, um, that's kind of a made-up name. They made that up. In fact. George V was not born, you know, he was not originally from the house of Windsor. He was from that house of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. That means they have German descent. And wouldn't you know it, if you're in a war with Germany, um, even, the, the, even the monarchy of Great Britain makes an effort to shed, to kind of um, wipe that away. And the royal family deliberately changed the house's name from Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, which was it basically, you know, was it was a, a German lineage, to Windsor, which they made up. Okay, so that's not the, the house's original name. Look at his face. I want you to remember his face. Okay, the last one. Here we are. He's not, he's not in that photograph that I showed you because, um, well, there's a good story why he's not there anymore. Um, the ruling monarch, of, absolute monarch, of all the monarchies in, in the Triple Entente, the one that was still an old-school absolute monarchy was the Russians. Um, he wanted no part in parliamentary uh, parliaments or liberal government or liberal ideas or any of that. He was very much still in the shadow of his father who died when he was young, Um, Alexander, Tsar Alexander. Tsar Alexander had a reputation of being a tough Tsar, but people wanted to kill him anyway, and they did, by throwing a bomb in his car, Um, trying to live up to his father's reputation. He throws his people into a war against the Japanese in 1905, and it ends badly, Um, the Russo-Japanese War. Um, And here he is, again, at the defense of the Serbians in, in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, he throws his country into another war. Russia's the first one to actually mobilize troops. Well, he's not going to survive this war, but that's a story for a, um, a PowerPoint in the future. That's a big spoiler. I want you to remember his face, too. And what am I telling you? Why am I telling you to remember faces? Because this is the last fun fact I'm going to leave you with. Everybody see on this slide, King George V. Tsar Nicholas uh, Romanov of Russia and Kaiser Wilhelm II. If they look familiar, that's not a mistake. They're all related. They're all cousins. I believe they're first cousins. They all share the same grandmother, Queen Victoria II. They all personally knew each other and spent time together, vacation time together. I mean, Wilhelm is older than the other cousins. Um, The the resemblance is... um, unmistakable okay so to some extent this was a family feud okay georgie and nikki teamed up against their older cousin willie um so yeah that there you have it those are the players in this war world history european history next presentation we're going to jump into the american experience in world war one